darling, just one more. But a lot of tonic this time. Yeah. I'd hate to get tipsy and disgrace myself on your show. <laughs> Why not, Drusilla? You disgrace yourself on everybody else's. Darling, mm. I know. But your little panel game's different, isn't it? Why? Well, I mean, here we are, three totally incompetent specialists How about you, trying Jeanine? to solve Thank an you. unsolved crime. Lemon, Drusilla? Television. Yes, and good television, too. I know that. But what if we solved your crime? Have you thought what would happen if we found your murderer for you? <laughs> yes, it's a nice thought. <laughs> you think you can? Good God, no. I haven't a clue what it's all about. But I shall throw in a few caustic comments. Don't worry. Oh, no. I'm sure you <laughs> shall. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. 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 Here comes the star of our show. One of them, Humphrey. Ooh. One of them. <laughs> oh, how nice Hello, to Jeanine. see how are you. Hello, Mrs. Temple. Come along and meet the others. Now, I think you both know Drusilla, don't oh, you? Drusilla. Yes, hello there. Oh, darling, you haven't met Humphrey Dean. This is my wife, Steve. Hello, hello. nice to meet you. How are you, Drusilla? Marvellous, darling, simply marvellous. Good, good. Touch outraged by the fee the shark has offered me, but apart from that... <laughs> <laughs> oh, Miss Dalton, uh, excuse me, Mr Margolis is here. Oh, excuse me. Yes, darling. Help yourselves to drinks, will you? Well, thank you, darling. So you two know each other, then? <laughs> Believe it or not. I cut my journalistic teeth reviewing those charming books of yours, didn't I, Paul? Yes, you did. I don't think I ever thanked her for that. So many light years away now, was I in favour of them? You slanged them one by one. That's why the sales were so good. Uh, <laughs> Darling! <laughs> She's not going to be on the show, is she? She will oh. show me up for the perfect fraud that I am. <laughs> Paul, I'd like you to meet Mr. Mr. Margolis. Oh, yeah. you know each other already? Yes. Well, of each other. I hear you've been down in our part of the world recently, Mr. Temple. Yeah, just for the day. I was doing a little homework on tonight's show. This is my wife, Steve. Dad, Good to why Margolis. didn't you warn me I'd have professionals for company on the panel? God, what's that? <laughs> a char from upstairs come in for a quick gin and tonic. Oh, oh, isn't, isn't she? Oh, yes, excuse me. Oh, no, I um, about 15 years. Is she with Paul? Oh, she's one of the results of the little homework he's been doing. Mr. Margolis. Mr. Dean, isn't it? Can I get you a drink before we start? Oh, thank you. Um, satellite? But what other surprises has your sleuth bit of husband got up your sleeve? Enough to keep guilty party well up in the charts, <laughs> darling. Sure, <laughs> I think you can manage that. I uh, think so. Good, good. Just answer the questions I put to you and tell them what you told me last week. Hmm? Yes. And don't worry. Hello, Jenny. How are you? For, you? for me. Thank you. Who's, uh... Oh. What's this? Oh, yes. How is she? Oh, thank you, darling. Oh, she'll be all right. Darling, what are these? They came this morning. <laughs> Fan mail already. <laughs> Janine, you are monstrous. You'll do anything to get your performer's adrenaline flowing, won't you? Handwritten block capitals in ballpoint. Have we all got the same message? What's it say? Lucia Valtrak is dead. If you find her murderer tonight, there'll be another death. Paul, surely you're not going to take these letters seriously. Well, why not? After all, guilty party exists to discuss murders where the murderer was never caught. Oh, well, maybe somebody's getting nervous. The murderer, you mean? Wouldn't you, if you thought the truth was going to come out? All right, shouldn't we do something about these nerves, You're then? damn right we should. May I? Where are you going, the police? And waste good publicity material. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, oh, else. I think I need another drink, oh. darling. Who else is going to be on the show? Just everyone here and those people from Fetching. Hmm? The Godfrey's, you mean? They're in makeup now. Oh, dear. What about Miss Armadine? Isn't she coming? Armadine? Who on earth she? A character out of one of your early novels? She ought to be. She's odd enough. Well, I thought she was rather crucial to your murder inquiry. Ah, she was never much help to us at the time. She's only here tonight because of Mrs. Godfrey and Maurice, the son. Mother, I do wish you wouldn't use that expression. All I said was you look queer. 
makeup on a man. It's not natural. Oh, Mrs. Godfrey, Janine Dalton. Hello, Mr. Godfrey. How do you go? Now, do come along and have a drink. Oh, thank you, I don't. It's against my principles. Oh, I see. Um, perhaps an orange juice. Fresh oranges? I don't think so. <coughs> oh, thank you, no. Uh, Mr. Godfrey, would you like a drink? Bless you. I'll have a gin and angostura. I'll leave you to uh, it, Only, Jenny. please, not too brutal with the bitters. Just the nearest hint. <laughs> well, isn't anyone going to introduce me? Mrs. Godfrey, I'm Humphrey Dean, the chairman of Guilty Party. I expect you've seen me from time to time. Why? Do you live at Fetchingham? <laughs> I meant on television. <laughs> said, uh, I regard watching television as a waste of time. No. The devil finds work for idle hands, you know. Who are you? I'm Drusilla Ardry. Uh, Mrs. Godfrey, if you come this way, then I'll introduce you to the others. Now, this is... Inspector Margolis. No, no, no. Mr. Margolis now, Mrs. Godfrey. I'm no longer in the force. He no. left an unsolved murder behind him, didn't you? Mm, simply because the person we wanted to interview disappeared from the face of the earth. Uh, Mrs. Godfrey, if I may. This is Mr. and Mrs. Oh, Mr. Temple and oh, his yes, wife, I know as well. Yeah. A charming couple, Mr. Dean. You should be grateful to have them on your show. Oh, well. <clears throat> oh, and this is my son, How do you do? Maurice. Yes, Hello. You didn't bring Miss Armadine up with you by any chance, did you? Why, hasn't she arrived yet? Of course she has. If I know Agnes, she's pestering some of your actors, getting to sign their names in that ridiculous autograph book of hers. I'm afraid to say she hasn't come yet, and we're getting a bit worried. Well, well she caught the train before ours. Oh. Said she had some wool to buy in Regent Street. Ought to be here by now. Train was on. The 11.30 stopping train. And she won't travel by expresses. Says they're too fast. Oh, I, <laughs> I told you she was on. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Is this where I'm supposed to be? Agnes! Uh, where have you been? Oh, to the other studios, Eunice. And they were the wrong ones. <laughs> but they were very good to me. And I, I got the autograph of Tom Jones. Oh, God, she's been to the other side. Humphrey, I hope you're in a good controlling mood tonight. Just feel in need of a drink, that's all. <laughs> <clears throat> Would you like a drink too, Miss Armadine? Oh, my dear, how very kind of you. Thank you, yes. uh, Agnes. Oh, Eunice, dear. After all, this is television, you know. And what good am I going to be if I don't win the quiz? Quiz? Yes, that is why I'm here, isn't it? Oh, my God. I'll have a gin, please, dear. Ice? Uh, no, no, thank you. That's an American habit, isn't it? And no tonic water either, thank you. I'll have it just as it comes, I think. It's stronger that way. Agnes! Auntie, darling. Yes. Oh, Maurice, darling. Oh, how well you're looking. You've got quite a tan. Have you been away? It's makeup. Oh, really, dear? Oh, what a very good idea. It suits you. We're so delighted you could come, but we'd like you to get to make up right away. We're about to start. Jenny, darling, could you see that she uh, gets... Do I have a tan, too? We Can start just... in five minutes. Oh. oh. Well, do you think I could have another little one in there just to take with me, please? And would it be all right if I knit? Knit? Yes. Oh, don't be ridiculous, Agnes. People aren't going to turn their television to watch you knitting. Well, I did hope to get my jacket finished. Just now that I've got way. the wool, that is. It would keep the devil at bay, wouldn't oh, it, please? For God's oh, sake, Drusilla, don't encourage her. It's going to be murder. Enough as it is. Oh. Surely you're an old hand at this sort of thing, Miss Arden. It's just the thought, darling, sitting all in front of all those studio lights, not knowing who might be lurking beyond. Oh, now, Drusilla, <laughs> keep that ghastly sense of melodrama for that wicked column of yours. <laughs> now, everybody, please, onto the set. Humphrey, oh, uh, excuse uh, me. Uh, um, something else is through there. Uh, there's a frustrated actress in there trying to get out. I don't want her to get shrieky just because some idiot wrote those notes. Well, good luck. I think you're going to need that in the gallery. You mean they're all like her around here? Excuse me, uh, would you like to come to the gallery oh, now, Mrs. Temple? Be brilliant. What else? Uh, Mr. Temple. I have a queer feeling about tonight. Something terrible is going to happen.
three minutes to the clock, Miss Dalton. Thank you, love. Excuse me. Are you quite sure that all these cables running under my seat are set? Good luck, everybody. Well, I'm very well. Good luck, Are you quite sure about that? Really? What's the matter? She says she's frightened of electricity. Of what? That's what she says. Oh, my God. All right, studio, stand by, please. Stand by. I'm terrified. Let's go home. Just like that? Unless you've got a better idea. Well, how about appearing on a TV show? Brute. You might at least hold my hand. <laughs> Metaphorically. Any way you like. Those notes weren't sent for nothing. No, I know. You know? Well, at least I suspect. But then that's what discussing murder's all about, isn't it? Mm. Well, listen. <laughs> Quiet, please. Mr. Humphrey Dean, Chairman of Guilty Party. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Now, in a show like Guilty Party, you, the audience, play a very, very important part. Not merely do you create the right atmosphere, but you help to keep all of us here on our toes. So, if in the course of the program some member of the panel comes out with a brilliant witticism, I beg you, feel free to laugh. But, however witty any of the remarks may be, even if they have the subtlety of Bernard Shaw, or the astringency of Dorothy Parker, please don't applaud, because I'll be livid for not having thought of it myself. <laughs> and uh, secondly, Secondly, and far more important, applause does tend to hold the show up. One more thing. Now, from time to time, you will find yourselves on camera, and you'll be able to see yourselves in the monitors up there. Not that you'll be looking, of course, because you'll be far too fascinated by what's going on up here. But if you do happen to glance up and catch sight of yourself and the pretty girl next to you on the screen, please try and ignore it. Uh, the screen, I mean, not the pretty girl. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, on a far more serious note, Guilty Party is a program in which we try to solve a hitherto unsolved crime. The crime tonight is murder. And who knows? We might just point the finger at the guilty person. And my uh, floor manager down there is making some strange, wild signs at me, which means we are coming up to time. So you have about ten seconds in which to cough. <laughs> Love it. One minute to go. They just okay, love it. Clock. What's the matter? Give me steady on two. I hadn't realised it's comedy potential. All chewing gum for the eyes, darling. How's it going, Robin? Fine. Tape running? Running. Okay, punch up one on the clock. Fifteen seconds to go. Stand by, TK. Right, studio, here we go. Ten, nine, eight. Run, TK. Seven, six, five, four, three, two. One. Q Grams and Fed Up Film. Coming to studio, one, two. Good evening, and welcome to the first of a new series of Guilty Party. Each week, with a panel of experts, we examine an unsolved crime, and by discussing it, hope to throw a new light on an old mystery. Now, in the panel tonight, we have Drusilla Ardrey, well known both as a journalist and as the author of the recently published and highly controversial book, The Homicidal Society. Good evening. Mr. Paul Temple, best-selling mystery writer and an acknowledged authority on crime. Hello. And Mr. Eric Margolis, managing director of Carry Safe Security Company, whose long career fighting crime has brought him face to face with many different kinds of criminals. Good evening. <laughs> now, the crime we are discussing tonight is murder. One that has never been solved. And remember, every unsolved murder means that the killer is still somewhere in our midst. Now, on Sunday the 22nd of March, 1964, this woman, Lucia Valchak, or to adopt the name by which she called herself, Lucy Walters, was brutally and sadistically murdered in the living room of her home, Beach Cottage, in Fetchingham in Suffolk. Now, the officer investigating the crime said, this murder reminded me of the worst type of gangland killing. Now, although several leads were followed up, the killer has never been found. The best person to tell us about this is that very officer, Mr. Margolis, who was head of Fetchingham CID and consequently intimately involved in the case. 
Mr. Margolis, now, there was a background to this killing, wasn't there? Yes. Would you mind telling us something about it? Well, uh, this happened about six months before the death of Mrs. Walters when a post office van carrying a large amount of used notes being taken to London for pulping was hijacked. And how much was in the van? Oh, 125,000 pounds. I'm sorry. Give or take a shilling or two, yes. Now, the raid was a success. A gang of three men rammed the van, immobilized the crew, and made off with the money. Now, none of this was ever recovered. But, in a way, this raid was a failure. No, in what way? The getaway car crashed into a stationary paraffin lorry. And with what result? Both men in the car were burned to death. Mr. Margolis, I thought you said there were three raiders. Oh, well, there were. But between the scene of the hijacking and the spot where the crash took place, one of those men disappeared. With the money or without it? Oh, with, most definitely with. Mr. Margolis, what is the tie-up between that and the murder of Lucy Walters? Well, I believe that the man who disappeared with the money handed it on to someone else, a fourth member of the gang, Lucy Walters. Is this a fact or supposition? Well, it's supposition, but it's based on fact. Walters was identified as one of the raiders. Now, that news came through to me at Fetchingham within oh, half an hour or so of the raid. What did you do then? I went round to Beach Cottage to get Mrs. Walters. Oh, really? Why? I imagine to see whether one of the charred bodies in the wreck was her husband's. Yes, and was it? Oh, yes, no doubt about that. Though it took me a heck of a long time to do such a simple job. Now, why such a long time? Because when I got to Beach Cottage, Mrs. Walters wasn't there. Sensible woman. Hmm? Well, if her husband was out working, why shouldn't she be out enjoying herself? For heaven's sake, you're making crime sound almost noble as an occupation. I'm talking entirely I'm... from a woman's point of view. Okay, Work no, comes think... first in far too many marriages yes, these days. Really, I think Mr. Margolis's point was that far from being out enjoying herself, Mrs. Walters was in fact working alongside her husband. Quite Isn't right, Mr. Yeah. Temple. Now, Mrs. Godfrey, would you mind? What, Inspector? I think Mr. Margolis would like to ask you some questions, Mr. Godfrey. Well, why doesn't he then? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I should perhaps explain that Mrs. Godfrey lived in the house next to Beach Cottage. I still do. And being neighbours of the Walters came to know them quite well? I knew him. He was rather a decent man, I always thought. A bit strange, perhaps, but then I suppose some of our English ways might seem a bit strange to him. <laughs> um, how about Mrs. Walters? Well, how forthrightly may I answer that question? In your own words, Mrs. Godfrey. She was a dreadful woman. Oh, mother really? Quite dreadful. Now, why do you say that? Well, because you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I meant uh, those particular words. She had a dreadful reputation in the neighborhood. Quite scandalous, some of her behavior. Now, in what way? Men. Mm. Go on, Mrs. Godfrey. Well, men. They were always calling on her. Really, I don't see what the local gossip has to do with this. Uh, you see, Mrs. Godfrey's observations are slightly off beam. The men that she observed calling on Mrs. Walters were not, in fact, her gentleman friends, but criminals. Mr. Margolis, would you like to elaborate on that? Oh, it's very simple. Since the Walters arrived in this country five years before as political refugees, their entire income had been derived from crime. And who can blame them? What do you mean? They were criminals. What is more natural than to steal for a living when society denies you the chance to make one for yourself? Oh, come on, Drusilla. They were refugees from one corrupt society to another. There was plenty of work in Fetchingham when Walters came there first with his wife. Labouring at 15 pounds a week. Do you call that a living, Mr. Margot? I call it honest. Rubbish. Oh, my God, just listen to him. Anyway, she's going to get up and sing the raven flag. I can't stand it. Stop recording. All the details. Mother's on the way down. Darling, why have we stopped? Just a small technical problem, my love, but don't you worry, you're doing marvelously, you two. Thank you. Humphrey. That stupid bitch, she goes off on that track. I don't want chunks of sociological insight on this program, especially not from her. And while you're at it, speed up my goals. Now, Temple has a special interest in this case. So, for God's sake, let's hear what the man has to say. It's all very ex interesting, isn't it, Mr. Temple? Do you think they're going to bring someone on in a minute to sing a little song? Don't be silly, Agnes. <laughs> all right, stand by, everybody. Mr. Dean, and cue. 
Now, it does seem fairly conclusive from what we've heard and from what Mr. Margulis has been saying that both Mr. and Mrs. Walters were involved in crime. Yes, but were they involved in this particular crime? I mean, in the hijack? Because yes, I think they were. Well, I don't no, think no, no, we no, can... No, 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 wait, Temple. So, wait. Now, look, fact. A man leaves the getaway car carrying the money and he disappears. Now, I think that he handed that money on to Mrs. Walters who was waiting to take it to a prearranged spot where the whole gang would meet up later for the share-out. And that's why she wasn't at home when you called with news of the crash. Exactly. But why was she murdered six months later? Because that's... Uh, because I think that she double-crossed them all. When she discovered that her husband had died in that crash, she decided to keep all the money for herself. Now, I think it's as simple as that. And you mean the surviving member of the gang had a different idea? Ah, well, 60,000 pounds is a lot of money. Yes, hence his motive for the murder. Ah, well, the job of establishing criminal guilt lies with the courts. Hmm? Now, I'm sure that you're not unaware of that simple, basic principle of English no, justice. No, 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 of course not. Nevertheless, it is true to say, isn't it, that at the time, everybody assumed that this man was the killer. Look, I may be awfully dim, but I suppose all this time we are talking about Bernard Donnelly. He was the surviving member of the gang, yes. All right, now we all agree we won't speculate that Bernard Donnelly is the killer. Still, perhaps you could give us something of his background. After all, it is central to the discussion to know something about him, isn't it? Well, no harm in that, I suppose. He's a professional. I mean, it's no secret to the police are still waiting to question him about his whereabouts in the day of that robbery. Well, you mean they haven't traced him yet? After all this publicity, I mean, oh, surely. Come on, Temple Donald has been gone to ground for some time now. You wouldn't find that too hard with all his criminal friends to help him. Bernard Donnelly knows the underworld like the back of his hand. Do you know what he's like, though, as a person? I just said. He's a, yes, he's a, you, he's a professional. Sorry, excuse me, you were quoted in that newspaper article that Humphrey Dean read out just now as saying at the time that the killing of Lucy Walters reminded you of the worst kind of gangland killing. Right. So you think Bernard Donnelly was capable of that sort of crime? Uh, you're putting words into my mouth again, Mr. Temple. No, well, all right, then. Do you think that Bernard Donnelly, did he strike you as a man who was capable of violence? Oh, look. Let us just say that there's nothing you can't get from a well-documented police file. Meaning yes. No, I th Paul, I think we leave that oh, point for a moment. The point it seems to... clear from let what me... Mr. Margolis look, has been... Let, let, us, let us just say that I don't like leaving unfinished business, eh? Well, uh, uh, nor, nor, incidentally, does the Chief Constable, which is why he allowed me to take part in this program. Miss Audrey, do you have any points? See? Well, yeah. only to say that I researched the case before coming on the program, and I'm bound to agree with Mr. Margolis that the crime was committed by the missing gang member. I don't see what other well, alternative Well, Drusilla, I'm bound to wonder how thoroughly you researched it. Well, I see? read the pathologist's report, if that's what you mean. No, no, not exactly, but uh, I suppose I do have an advantage uh, over darling, you. just because I'm a woman, that has nothing <laughs> to do with it. <laughs> no, I wouldn't dream of suggesting it has. I'm sure you'd look utterly charming in a policewoman's uniform. I was only... That's just That's fine. Time oh, enough, darling, eh? don't tell me they're going to get bitchy with each other. Well, that depends on how much he hates being proved wrong. Does Paul know something new about this case? Coming to two. Paul, you were saying? I was trying to say that Bernard Donnelly did not kill Lucy Walters. He couldn't have done rubbish. Excuse me. Mrs. Donnelly, would you mind coming up, please? Do forgive me, but I, I think I do see my guess. somebody we should hear from. Thank you very much. Right up. Is this all right? Yes. Could we have another chair? Thank you. Uh, sit down, Mrs. Donnelly. <clears throat> now then, uh, would you tell us your name first of all? I'm Mary Donnelly. And you are? Uh, Bernard's mother, yes. Tell us about Bernard. Would you, what was he like, Mrs. Donnelly? Well, uh, he wasn't a bad lad. Oh, he used to steal and all that, but he got that from his father. Bernard's had a lot of trouble in his life, hasn't he? wasn't very bright. He had to have special treatment. What for? Well, uh, it was a bit silly. He couldn't, he, he couldn't, you know... Coordinating. That's what the hospital said. Yeah. In fact, he was mentally retarded, wasn't he? Uh, that's right. It wasn't our fault. There was nothing we could do. Did he live at home with you? Uh, not very often. You see, there was these special schools. Then he went to London. After that, it was prisons. Yes, so you never really saw very much of him, did you? He always wrote. He was always very kind to me. And tell us what he was like as a person. Big and soft, really, and very gentle. <laughs> Thank you very much. 
Well, no, Mrs. Donnelly, would you mind? Just waiting a few more moments. Mm. Well, there we are then. A soft man and a gentleman, and yet this is the man that Mr. Margolis said committed a brutal gangland killing. That's quite a contrast in opinions. I wonder which of the two of you is right. Well, I think this is one occasion when you'll have to side with the expert. Oh, I quite agree with you. This man that you want for murder has been in hospitals, he's been in remand homes, borstals, prisons. That's a great background. A lot of then, psychiatrists have spent a lot of time trying to guide him back towards a normal sort of life. But well, it wasn't very quite... well spent. My Bernie never killed no one. Quite. The one thing that all the experts agree on is that in spite of Bernard Donnelly's criminal behaviour patterns, he would never resort to violence. Oh, um, you must admit, prison psychiatrists tend to go over the top on occasion. He would never resort to violence. Now, Mrs. Donnelly, uh, you told me something when I met you last week. Would you mind telling us all again? Please take a time. I think my Bernie's dead. He'd always write to me, no matter what trouble he was in. I'd get letters and postcards from him, no matter where he was. Uh, one time, Mr. Temple, he escaped from Boston. Five months they were searching for him, yet each week uh, I got my letters same as usual. Love and kisses from Bernie. Each week and now since... For seven years there hasn't been a word from him. Not one single word. He's dead, that's all. I just know he's dead. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Donnelly. Thank you very much. Now, I've said that I don't think that Bernard Donnelly killed Lucy Walters. You'll need I'm... something rather more than a mother's emotion to substantiate that temple. To Come say now. nothing of these highly questionable reports from the prisons, really. I sometimes wonder why we spend so much time and energy trying to prove the innocence of the wrongdoer. If we just devoted, say, half as much time to maladjusted kids... Well, Drusilla, yeah. Bernard yeah. Donnelly was a maladjusted kid. He's also a much maligned one. Oh, yes, but, Paul, you couldn't actually call that proof. No. But I think that this is. Paul, well, may I ask where you got it? Yes. It was dropped in my letterbox a week ago. Well, there's no date on it. It's not signed. It simply says Bernard Donnelly couldn't have killed Lucia Valchak because he died six months before she did. Oh. <laughs> All right, all right, I know. A revelation like that on telly is simply devastating stuff. But how does it prove that Bernard Donnelly no, no, didn't I know the it doesn't prove anything, but, but we all know what happened six months before the murder. You mean the hijacking of the... Murder? Exactly, and that's why I think that this note is significant. Now, let's, let's just suppose for a moment that Bernard Donnelly died in that crash and that it was one of the other men who got away. But he didn't. Both men, the driver and Walters, were identified by their wives. Well, what if Mrs. Walters was mistaken in her identification? But she was I think she was. I also think that this note was written by Lucy Walters' husband. That it was Bernard Donnelly who died in that crash. I knew it! The whole I of your it. murder investigation was based on looking for a man who was already dead. Uh, oh, get on Donnelly, no. stop the recording! No, I want all that stuff. Get on Donnelly's mother, she's dead! Look, he used to want that sensational stuff. You sit here and bloody will direct it. That, that damned idiot. Run! Could we have a few words? All right, break studio for five minutes. All right, we'll just hold it there, please. When is it going to be my turn? When I've finished my go, I shouldn't be surprised. He's so rude, that Inspector Margolis, yes, cutting yes. me off like that. Well, Mother, you were just a teeny bit upset because you were getting everything so wrong. I told you that all those men calling at the cottage were crooks. Do you remember? I told you that at the time. Ah, but crime wasn't the only reason she had all those callers, Agnes, dear. Well, what's the matter? Haven't you ever heard of crimes of passion? Oh, don't oh, be so vulgar. Yeah. And do stop poking your eye or smear your mascara. Yes. All right, there you go, Robin. All right, studio. Stand by. All right, settle down, please, settle down. If you would like to continue, Mr. Temple, on my cue. Me, yes. Uh, now, of course, everything that I've just been saying could be mere speculation, except for one fact, the handwriting on this note that I received. Uh, 
I'm going to, could we have the caption now, please? Thank you. Now, there's a certain characteristic about the way that that name is written. If you look the horizontal bar through the L, there's only one European language that has this characteristic, and that's Polish. Now, before the show tonight, three of us sitting here received another note. Once again, Lucy Walters was referred to as Lutra Waltrak. Now, Lucy Walters' husband, Joseph, is Polish, and I believe that he wrote all of these notes. This is getting too far-fetched. If I may just finish. Haven't you what? dazzled us enough as it is, darling? Now, assuming I'm right... I spent uh, five solid months investigating this crime. Yes, and I believe you came up with the wrong conclusion. But you haven't got one solid shred of evidence. Haven't I? Go and talk to the psychiatrist, talk to the handwriting oh, experts... Really who... <laughs> Once again, guilty parties are live with controversy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if I may at this moment summarise what we've heard so far. Now, we've heard from Mr Margolis the probability that this crime was committed for money. Mr. Temple, on the other hand, has hinted it wasn't... No, I'm not hinting, actually. I'm putting forward this theory very seriously. Mr. Temple is suggesting, then, that Bernard Donnelly could not have killed Lucy Walters because violence was against his nature, and secondly, he was already dead at the time of Lucy Walters' death. Yes, that's right. For some reason, she deliberately identified the wrong body. No. She did not. Who else was in the mortuary at the time? I was. And you're sure it was Walters? Yes. You have no doubt that the body she identified was her husband? Look, Temple, look, let, let us just assume for a moment that, for whatever reason, Mrs. Walters and I were mistaken in our identification of the body that the dead man was, after all, Bernard Donnelly. Yes. Now, all right. Now, who was it, then, who killed Lucy Walters? Well, that's... I that's suppose a, that's we're all absolutely sure that she is dead. Oh, oh come on. <laughs> Just, um, yes, her husband. Yes, really. Her husband. Could he have done it? Oh, that's ridiculous. Why? My dear Miss Armadine... Surely you know over 85% of the murders committed in this country happen within the family group. Well, in your book, The uh, Homicidal Society, you put the number at 68%, Miss Audrey. You've read it? Oh, yes. You see, when I heard you were going to be on this programme, I thought I... Well, I never met you, you see. So I thought I'd better read it to see if I could find out what sort of person you were. <laughs> and did you? Oh, yes. <laughs> and you are quite wrong about Lucy and Joseph Walters, because they loved each other, especially him. He worshipped the ground she trod on. He told me once about their escape from Poland together. It was she who made it all possible, you know. And did you know that there were three of them? Lucy's sister came with them, more, and Joseph told More them. irrelevant David. information. Yes, no, no, I do. Would you excuse me just for a moment? I wonder if we could try and find out a little more about Lucy Walters. Mrs. Godfrey, what was she like? I mean, you must have known her pretty well. Oh, I mind my business, and I expect others do the same. Besides, she was very secretive. Well, what about you, Mr. Godfrey? Did you have anything to do with Lucy Walters? Oh, yes. <laughs> she was interested in antiques. Oh, really? That's your line, isn't it? Oh, yes, I have my own shop. Bygones and antiques. Oh, very grand now. My little house suited him well enough for 36 years, and then all of a sudden he ups and leaves me, sets himself up in business and moves out. And that would be, uh, when? 1965. I remember it very well. About a year after the robbery, yes? What exactly are you getting at, Mr Temple? I think he's wondering where you got the money so suddenly to start your business. That was my own money. Every penny of it. Mm. As a matter of fact, I won it. On the football pools. Uh. The football pools? <laughs> yes. Yes, he won £16,000. <laughs> Wasn't he lucky? All that money. And I never saw a penny of it. Well, he did insist that I should take a little, just for allowing me to, him to use my address. Do you understand? How much? A thousand pounds. Oh, always such a very generous boy, especially to me. He's been so good to me. Actually, it was Maurice who gave me my lovely new electric alarm clock, you know. Though I did tell him at the time, it was very naughty of him to spend all that money on me. Paul. Because he knows very Paul, well, honey. especially oh, yes, yes. like that. Uh, excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt again, Miss Armadine, but there, there mm. is <coughs> just one other person I'd like to talk to. I spoke to her earlier on the telephone today. She lives in Canada now. This is Lucy Walter's sister. Galina Busansky, and I believe we're, we're going to talk to her on the uh, satellite link-up, aren't we? Yes, ladies and gentlemen, at this moment we are going over to Toronto by satellite to talk to Mrs. Galina Busansky, sister of the murdered woman. Good evening, Mrs. Busansky. Uh, can you hear me? Pardon me? <laughs> I said, can you hear me? Oh, that's better. It's okay now. Good. Well, thank you very much, Mrs. Busansky, for agreeing to answer some questions for us. You're welcome. 
Uh, Mrs. Vysansky, we haven't much time, so I'm handing you over now to Mr. Paul Temple. Mrs. Vysansky, hello. I believe you received a letter from your sister shortly before she died. That's right, yeah. W would you mind telling us what it said? Well, uh, to tell you the truth, it was a little confused. Uh, like she was in some sort of trouble, you know? What did she say? Oh, there was a whole lot about her and Yusef. I don't know, I sort of got... Oh. Mrs. Vysansky, we appear to have lost you. <laughs> it oh, always happens. I, I, oh, there we are. Yes. I, I said <laughs> I got the impression that she felt very guilty over something. Maybe something she'd done to him. Like Re letting him down. You mean recently, since the robbery? Oh, yeah. I kind of got the impression it was going on all the time. I wrote her about it. Uh, anything else? Well, yeah. She said... I, I don't know, this bit was really confused. Well, I gathered someone was upsetting her. Uh, she didn't say who or, or what about. She seemed, well, sort of frightened to me. You know, like, like something was going to happen soon. Something real big. And what did you do? Well, I phoned her and said, did she want to come over for a while? Zbyshek, uh, uh, that's my husband. He wouldn't mind paying the fare. Yes, I don't imagine that uh, Lucy was particularly short of money at that time, was she, Galena? Well, no. And how did she react to your suggestions? I I'm sorry. Did she want to accept your invitation? Oh, yeah, she did. Oh, but she said there was something she had to do first, and then she'd be free to come. Mm. And that was the last time you spoke to her? Yeah. Just one more question. At any time after the robbery, did you hear from your sister that her husband Joseph had been killed or was dead? No. No, I didn't. Well, now, isn't that rather strange? I mean, if he had died in that crash, wouldn't you have been the first person to be told? Well, I guess so. There's no one else. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> You're welcome. So, in those few weeks preceding the murder, someone was frightening Lucy Walters. Now, who was this person? Was it Bernard Donnelly? Was it Joseph Valchak, who, as you've just heard Mrs. Vysansky suggest from Toronto, was in all probability still alive at that time? Or was it someone who, as Mr. Templer suggested, we haven't heard of in the discussion up till now. Mr. Margulis, would you mind telling us something about the night of the crime? Well, it was a long night for me, starting at about 2 a.m. when I got a telephone call at home from Mrs. Walters. At home? Why did she have your home number? Well, she'd complained about this prowler before, and she was alone and scared, I think. Anyway, I was pretty convinced that she was concerned with the robbery, and I thought it was a good excuse to keep an eye on her. I often called round unexpectedly. So how long were you at the cottage that night? Fifteen minutes. I left at about 2.30, and I went back home. He did. I, I saw him from my bedroom window. I told him I had when he called the next day to talk about it. Are you usually up and about at 2.30 in the morning, Miss Armadine? Uh, oh, no. Oh, no, dear, not usually, but I didn't feel very well that night. And, and so I got up to make myself some hot water and peppermint. You know, it's very good for you when you've got anything... Um, <clears throat> well, I knew it would be very good for you. How could you be sure of the time? Because I looked at my clock. Uh, what time did you get home? A few minutes later. I only lived down the road. Now, what happened then? Well, about an hour later, I got another call. And, oh. It's all right, everyone. Don't worry. It's only an electric bulb. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I knew the moment we came into this place that we were in danger. Danger from what? Electricity. Oh, I do so hate electricity. I never use it in the lodge, you know, not unless I really have to. Okay, now, Mr. Dean. Oh, and, the, and these trains right. that run off uh, electricity. Mr. Margulis, you were saying... You know, they're absolute death traps. <clears throat> Give me the old steam engines every oh, time. Oh, be quiet, <laughs> What, what? Oh, dear, has the game started again? Yeah, um, Mr. Margulis, you were about to tell us the exact time you got the telephone call informing you of Lucy Walters' death. Yes, it was about 3.30 a.m. on the 22nd of March, 1964. We received a 999 emergency call. And the sergeant at Fetchingham rang me at home and told me that Lucy Wallace had been stabbed. Was the time of death established? Yes, it was. 3.30 a.m. Give or take a minute or two. <laughs> now, there was nobody near or around the cottage, but we heard a few days later that a man answering to the description of Bernard Donnelly had been seen in the neighborhood. So he became the suspect? We were keen to have a few words with him, obviously. <laughs> oh, that must be the understatement of the year. Uh, who, who was it told you that he'd been seen in the neighbourhood? What are you getting at, Temple? I was just gently probing. I... But to no real end, Paul. Well, I'm not sure of that. Miss Armadine, what time was it when Mr. you saw Mr. Margolis leave? 
Um, about half past two. Yes, I, I know it was that because I looked at my lovely new electric alarm clock. Now, Auntie, darling, you don't mean that. You hated it from the day I gave it to you. Well, only because it runs off electricity, dear. I never dare to touch it. Of course, I, I might be mistaken in the time, Mr. Temple. I'm not very uh, good just, at, just uh, at that time. Just, excuse me, I'm sorry. What, what was the date of this murder again? Sunday, the 22nd of March, 1964. I, I'm sorry. Uh, Ginny, would you mind stopping? There's something uh, not quite right. I'm God! Now what does he want? All right, well, stop the corner. Oh. Start or something, give him time. Ready again. Settle down, please, ladies and gentlemen. Stand by, Mr. Dean. Well, Paul, you've created a mild sensation here, and we're all dying to know what it's all about. Well, it's something that I think uh, Mr. Margolis here will appreciate. You see, up to this point, there have been two conflicting facts which didn't make any sense to me. Ah, uh, but now they do. Oh, yes. The first concerns time and electricity. Miss Armadine, you mentioned earlier that you have an electric clock. Yes, yes. Which you never touch. Oh, no. Oh, no. I wouldn't dare to touch it. Well, some time ago, I wrote a novel. And it wasn't a very inspired one, as I think you pointed out at the time, Drusilla. <laughs> but the plot concerned a time factor. It was set in 1964, which is the same year as it happens that Lucy Walters was murdered. Darling, I may be awfully dim, but I don't see what you're driving at. Well, it's simply that in 1964, British summertime was still in operation. All clocks had to be put forward one hour. Was yours, Miss Armadine? Did anybody else adjust it for you, then? Oh, no, no, I, I, I don't think Did so. Did it even occur to you to think about summertime? Uh, no, not really. What no. are you getting at, Temple? Well, now that we've established that Miss Armadine's clock was an hour slow, it wasn't at 2.30 a.m. that she saw you leaving Beach Cottage. It was an hour later at 3.30, just before Lutra Valchak rang the exchange and said she'd been stabbed. The hell are now, you that was the first fact that I couldn't make sense of. The second was the report or the statement from the telephone operator who took that emergency call, and I quote, this woman came on, she was in a bad way, I could tell. She said, help me, help me. Galena, Galena. All the time she kept saying this name, Galena. Now, of course, everybody assumed that she was calling for her sister, Galena. I don't think she was. She wasn't saying Galena. She was saying Glena. Glena, which is Polish for hop. <laughs> Lena is Polish slang for policeman. Cop! Chuck. Get the police! No! Come on, get some bloody light on him! Why did you do it? I loved her. Do you know what love is, Mr. Margulies? It's like a fire. It burns. Hurts. When the fire is put out, you get cold. Very cold. Please, everyone, keep calm. You killed her! Why? Why should you do that? Was it the money? Is that what you wanted? You knew all the time I was alive, didn't you? But you let me stay dead. Why don't you shut up, all of you, and listen? Maybe you can learn something new. He knew I was alive. Why did you let her identify the wrong body? Why did he let her do that? Blackmail? Is that what you were doing? Is that why you got the money to start your new business? Yes. You're a big man now, Mr. Margulis. Successful. Did you get the money from Lucy by promising to keep quiet about me being alive? Don't answer. Do you want to die? Do you feel guilty? Why did he have to kill her? Why couldn't he have just... I don't understand. I don't understand unless... Unless she called your bluff. Yes. Yes. 
It would be just like Lucy. She would do that. Did you threaten to tell your superiors that you were blackmailing her? Is that why she, is that why you killed her? I didn't. I that was true. Nothing. I mean, it's ridiculous to believe that I could talk. Please, Mr. Tindale. I don't care about being caught. I wouldn't be here if I did. I only care about Lucy. I care that she was killed. Jeez. I care that she's no longer here. I care about her murder. Are you? No. After all this time, all the waiting, I thought I would feel happy to hold your life in my hands. Some people can kill without remorse, without feeling. You did! I... And as you will agree, ladies and gentlemen, a sensational and completely unpredictable revelation by our guest tonight, Mr. Paul Temple. Thank you, Mr. Temple. Next week, we have Mr. Tom Ellerton, the well-known criminologist, joining us. And who knows, he may again find the truth and surprise us once again in the next edition of Guilty Party. This is Humphrey Dean saying good night and thank you for being with us. Cue applause. Fantastic. Mm, and I hear you got the lot. Hmm? <laughs> Every duty moment. <laughs> good, good. Oh, uh, by the way, I shall want to approve the final version before transmission. Oh, just leave that to me. Uh, Janine, I think that might be a bit dangerous. What? Why? <laughs> I've been telling Paul about your taste for sensationalism. So I'd like to vet the final version, eh? Sorry, producer's prerogative. Oh, really? Read the small print in my contract. I had my lawyer put it there specially. You have got a nasty reputation. Good night. Thank mm -hmm. you.